All right, so we're getting down. Normally, in the past, what I've done is I've had a critical thinking challenge where I ask you, with regard to certain types of objections, which was the handling objections drop box that was on D2L that I um, had you switch over for your asking questions to put it in the new drop box. I've in the past done this handling objections drop box. And what I've done is I've asked you to match social styles with the particular method of handling an objection. And so, uh, you know, that was a written exercise. Because we're running out of time and we have a class that's been preempted and I'm having to shuffle things around as a result of the fact that we have the National Council on Undergraduate Research coming in next week and classes are preempted one day that affects this class, which is Thursday. I'm going to do that critical thinking challenge, so I'm telling you right now, if you want to get out your books and look at the types of social styles, again, to sort of match them with the way of method of handling an objection, because what I'm going to do is make this an individual critical thinking challenge for today. So if you can tell me which social style would, would be most receptive to a certain type of um, handling or use of a technique in handling an objection, and also which social styles would be most likely to use a particular objection, then you can win bonus points. I'll give you five points for each one that you can articulate a rational response to the objection or the technique in handling that objection. Um, so uh, you can earn some bonus points today on that as opposed to having me do, have you do a paper, so we're going to do an in-class. So if you want to look at those social styles and sort of review those um, quickly, think about that and that will give you an opportunity since the average exam score, I think, in your I'm pretty sure it was, I, not exactly because you asked me, but I'm pretty sure it was about 65. So you'll probably want some opportunities to, to get uh, bonus points to So let's talk about what objections are. And it looks like the, I'm going to turn this off for one minute and see if I can. That's great. If you don't, you know, I won't have any way of of knowing that you didn't, but I'm supposed to encourage you, you should do that. It's an opportunity, so UCO this year gets to host the um, National Conference on Undergraduate Research, and so it's an opportunity for you to go and see what people are doing in other disciplines and other colleges, and even in our own college, and it's a good opportunity. I encourage students to do that kind of thing. Since we are a teaching institution, we, we generally try to do that kind of thing with our students, and I've done um, student presentations, I've had students present at two conferences here at UCL, and it's been a good opportunity for those, particularly anyone who wants to go into graduate work. So, what an, object, what an objection is and isn't. It's not necessarily an adversarial relationship. It seems like that because somebody's telling you no, or they may be hesitating, and you take no as, as no, but it's a little bit like the First Amendment. The Supreme Court of the United States, the First Amendment to the Constitution, so I use this example, and I think it's important, one of the things that you can do in helping think about uh, preparing for this last exam and then the final exam is understanding what the terms are and how they apply to real life situations. And so since I was a lawyer for a long period of time, uh, I, when I started studying sales and getting my PhD and looking at objections and how salespeople handle them, one of the things that I related it to was, so for example, my legal training. And so if you can make these things personal to you, it will help you. So the First Amendment of the United States Constitution says, Congress shall make no law. And then it lists five substantive rights that Congress is not supposed to abridge. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, press, religion, petition of government for redress of grievances or assembly. Those are the five substantive rights that are found in the Constitution. Now, the court has never said that no means it's an absolute term. I tend to think, because I tend to be a driver and therefore I tend to look at things as being black and white, that no is an absolute term and not an equivocal term. And what do I mean by that? Well, 
let's think about this when you were a kid. And you asked your mother if you could have, what was your favorite cookie as a child? Chocolate chip. Chocolate chip. You love chocolate chip cookies. You're boring. Chocolate chip oatmeal, that's the key. Chocolate chip oatmeal, that's, that's a little bit more exotic because now you're, you're combining, you know, uh, textures and flavors there. Uh, so you asked your parents if you could have the chocolate chip cookie and your mother said no. And if you were like me, you were a why child and you'd say why. And, well, because we're going to have dinner in an hour and I don't want you to ruin your appetite. Well, why? Well, because it's important that you eat something that's nutritious. Well, why? Well, so that you'll grow up to be big and strong. Well, why? So that you, you know, you won't die. And that's what we call the terminus ad quem, the point at which it no longer makes sense to ask why that. And of course, I was a why child, and so I would ask why that. But you know, you, you would, your parents would get exhausted with you, and they would just resort to the ultimate in parental authority, which is rather than explaining at length, why it is that they were telling you no, they would resort to that phrase which all children hate, which I hated, which is because I said so. Right? And that just that's supposed to end the debate. I'm the parent, I'm the authority figure because I said so. And so no generally meant when I was a kid and I asked my parents for something and they said no, it generally my parents didn't say no a whole lot. But when they did, it meant no. It there, there was no getting around it. You were not going to do that. It didn't mean if your parents said no oatmeal chocolate chip cookie before uh, dinner, it didn't mean half a cookie, did it? Or a quarter of a cookie? Or a tenth of a cookie? It meant no cookie. It was an absolute term. Well, with regard to the First Amendment, the Supreme Court, for example, has never said that no is absolute that you have an absolute right to say whatever you want to say, whenever you want to say it. And the classic example of that comes um, from uh, the United States versus Shaq in a case written by Oliver Wendell Holmes, in which he says, no one would seriously argue that the right of free speech would allow somebody to walk into a crowded theater and yell, everybody should know this from American National Government, what? What can't you yell in a crowded theater? Fire. Fire. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater because what will happen is it will cause a panic and a knee-jerk reaction and people will start running for the exits. And that might result in people being injured or hurt or trampled. Because what are what goes on in theaters? Well, we watch in this day and age, we watch movies in theaters. They're generally dark. You run into the crowded theater and you yell fire. And that's going to cause some maybe bad things to happen. So no has never been an absolute term with regard to the Supreme Court. It's been an equivocal term. No means maybe. And I think that's a useful way, an analogy, of thinking about your prospects. When they say no, if they're truly a qualified prospect, it doesn't usually mean no forever and absolute. It's, it's maybe a stall or a put off. And so it's not necessarily, an objection is not necessarily a no, even if they say, they say no. And a lot of objections don't actually start with no. They say, well, I can't, or I need, or something like that. And so what, are, what objections can be is they can be a key to closing the sale. If somebody's discussing things with you and they're engaging in dialogue, it means that they're open to your idea. If, they're, if they don't have their arms folded, and we'll talk about that body language, and just looking at you and saying no, um, it can be a key to closing, to overcoming their resistance and making the sale and really making a much more beneficial sale by understanding what it is that they need and how you can help them and how your product or service can meet their needs. So again, as the PowerPoint says in the text tell you, it can be a buying signal that says, here are my conditions for buying. I'm concerned if you're selling ADP, for example, since we did ADP in the last one, I'm concerned about my employee's security. You know, no, I don't want to buy your product because it's web-based and I'm, I'm afraid, you know, we've all heard this, the horror stories about people being hacked or worse yet, let's say one of the things you can do with your ADP and that they, that they sell as a big feature of being able to do payroll is what? If you watch the ADP sales uh, presentations that we did at the beginning of the semester, what was one of the things that they showed people in those mock sales interviews with the, the prospects at NCSC? 
you can do payroll where? Mm -hmm. On your phone. Now, how many of you, I mean, if I'm a security conscious person, how many of you have lost this device? Could somebody easily, now it turns out that Apple actually has turned it into such a, a, a hard lockdown that not even the FBI can unlock it, even using you know, sort of the best pro hackers to try and get into it, but um, I'm, I'm sure somebody can. That could be really an arresting prospect for somebody who, who thinks, gosh, I, I'm you know, out doing payroll on my phone at lunch one day and I leave my phone, can somebody get that, can they get all the data? Not just to my employees, but probably of, of me as well and all of the stuff that you're going to give to ADP because that involves things like social security numbers. And so if you could overcome that by showing them that this is encrypted with the same level of security that's used by banks and things like that, you can use that as a selling point. So you still have the convenience of being able to use this device to do payroll, but you don't necessarily have the risk. So it can be a buying signal, a condition for, um, for actually buying. And it can indicate generally people when they ask or when they, when they raise an objection that is truly an objection, it's an indication that they're actually interested in what you're saying. If they're not just saying no and folding their arms across their chest, it can be an indication that they are actually interested. Because people, if they're not interested or they're not curious, they won't ask questions or they won't raise objections that are real, that are real objections. So it's one of these things that salespeople have a fear of, but they, they shouldn't necessarily because it can be a, a way of ensuring that you've got a really good sale. So the types of objections. The stall or the put off. Now this one says that it's rare. Your textbook tells you that this is rare if the buyer is truly qualified. And I'm gonna I'm going to put a caveat on that. That's true if you're dealing with fairly simple goods or straightforward transactions in a business to consumer setting. And so the textbook is obviously written for a wide variety of things. It's not necessarily true if you are dealing with a large organization or if you're dealing with a governmental or nonprofit entity. Uh, a put off or a stall is in many instances, particularly in government, and one of, one of the things that I've emphasized in here is in knowing the buying center in a governmental agency, a stall or a put off is probably always going to happen, at least initially, because when a agency decides that they need something, or when you decide that you want to sell them something, they're probably, unless you're coming in, and so for example, what is the fiscal year for the state of Oklahoma? Anybody know what the fiscal year? If you're selling to the state, you should know what this is. What is the fiscal year for the state of Oklahoma? I think it's March. It's not. Anybody know what the fiscal year is for most, most states? <laughs> most states and municipalities operate, and I don't know why this is, but it's a historical phenomenon, they operate on a July 1 to June 30 fiscal year. That's just sort of the standard fiscal year for most state governments and most municipalities. Now, there are some states that are outliers in that, but it's a July 1 to June 30. What does that mean? Well, it means that if they've already adopted and passed their budget, so for example, when I was the city councilman in the city of Guthrie, we were on, and we actually changed our fiscal year so that it didn't correspond with the state, and there were some advantages to doing that because it allowed us to then see what kinds of state revenues we could get or we might qualify for in terms of grants and aid that were not necessarily on their system and we weren't necessarily a year behind. So we actually changed our fiscal year in Guthrie. But, but historically, our fiscal year was July 1 to June 30. That's the state fiscal year. It's the state fiscal year. It's the fiscal year for uh, the University of Central Oklahoma since we're a state entity. That means that if you don't get your requests in, or you don't start looking at it before that July 1, and it, it comes in a, lot, a long time before then, because we stop purchasing the last month of the fiscal year here at UCF. And actually, if you want to have a big purchase for the next capital year, you're going to have to get that in, and you're going to have to start looking at those long before the June 30th deadline. 
organizations like UCO start planning our capital expenditures for things like projectors, if we're going to buy a whole bunch of those, screens, buildings, things like that, well before that June 30 deadline or before that July 1st deadline, in terms of what we're thinking about doing in the next, we plan over a year out, is what I'm telling you. So the stone of the put off is rare if you have a truly qualified prospect in the business to consumer market. It may be more common in the business to business, particularly if you're dealing with nonprofit or with governmental agencies where the buying cycle is such that they have to budget for it and it has to have a specific line item in most budgets. Um, does anybody know what the federal fiscal year is? It's October 1 to September 30. And I don't know why the feds have ever done that. You would think that they would do it from Jan 1 to December 31st, right? That would seem to make the most sense. Um, but historically, they've never done it that way. So it's just, it's sort of an odd system. So you have to be aware of that. Um, what type of social style do you think is most likely to give you a stall or put off? <coughs> Why? Yeah, that's correct. That's the that's the correct answer. It's because they are they are oftentimes overwhelmed by analysis paralysis, and so they're going to think about things for a long time. Which is the least likely to give you a stall or put off in terms of a social style? Drivers. drivers that's actually great. So, yeah, you get 10 points. Drive, drivers are the least likely to. Why is that? A driver is just going to tell you, you know, a stall or a put off is what? What is a stall or a put off? I, I have to think about it. I don't have the money right now. Um, I'm just not ready to make a decision. That's a stall or a put off. A driver is just going to do what? No. No. It's just going to be no and get out. If you get too pushy, it's going to be no and leave, right? So it's going to be the driver's lease. So what is it uh, that you can do to handle this? Um, handling this, the text tells you, is a test of attitude. This is the one that you're going to maybe have to make callbacks on and, and close. You're going to have to ask for this more than once in this one. Most salespeople give up after the first or second, a huge percentage quit after the first no, an even bigger percentage give up after the second, and some give up after the third. Those that, and, and in most of life, there is sort of an 80-20 rule. What do I mean by the 80-20 rule? 20% of the sales force out there make about 80% of the commissions. 80% make 20%. Think about that. Why? The ones that are in that 20% that are the most successful at this are the ones that are what? systems. They're the ones that will go back time after time after time. So how else do you deal with this objection? So it's a test of, that, of attitude and, and staying power. Uncover the real reason behind the stall. Now, again, if you're dealing with an organizational situation like a school or a governmental entity or a nonprofit, the real reason may be the fiscal year. And so figuring out how to get into the fiscal cycle when they will submit or when they will go out for RFPs is going to be critical. If it's a business consumer and you have an analytical who's putting you off, what are they really searching for? Probably more information on how this product or service is going to fit with, with their specific needs. The searcher your text tells you this is a hidden request for more information. Which one is also most likely to be a searcher? Yeah. Analytical. Why? They like, they like to research. Yeah. So the searcher, and again, these are not necessarily <coughs> hard and fast and mutually exclusive. You can see several types of objections within the same prospect, right? Um, so these are oftentimes done by the analytical. 
Uh, your text tells you to handle it with finesse, show that the product can solve their, their problems. So with analyticals and the searcher, what do you think you need to do to handle that? Which means what? Provide them with data overload. Give them lots of data. Facts and figures work really, really well. Um, demonstrate the affordability. Demonstrate the difference between what they have now and what you can offer. Again, knowing your product and knowing your product's particular strengths. Again, going back to what I said at the beginning of class, redundancy is good. Differentiation is perhaps the most important word in marketing today. What makes ADP different from TACOM? They're both really similar. What makes them different from Patriot Software? I'm going to tell you what makes them. Paycom and ADP are really, really similar products. They're going to compete mostly on price point. But what makes them different from, say, Patriot? How many of you have heard the ads on uh, the radio for Patriot Software? The guy who started his own business and he got hit with a huge fine from the IRS because he hadn't done the withholding correctly. So he developed his own software to make payroll easy for small businesses. What's going to be the big difference between Patriot and software? Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. They've just not been in the market as long as AEP. And they don't have the financial capital to highly capitalize the risk that's associated with if you get this wrong and the fines that can result from that. Now, what does that mean? It means they're generally cheaper but there's a trade-off, right, there. There's what we call an opportunity cost. The hidden objection. This one, and the old version of the textbook, I don't know, does the new one have this as a iceberg? The, the picture of the iceberg? Yeah. Right. So we all have watched the show with the, at one time, skinny little kid called Titanic. What happens to the Titanic? We all know what happens. Well, the reason they didn't stop in time is because by the time they could see the top of the iceberg, the bottom of it, which was the vast majority of it under the water, had already sliced through the hull of the Titanic and it was sinking. Hidden objections are, are difficult to deal with. They may be enormously personal and emotional and not easily articulated. One of the things that we know in marketing and doing marketing research that I have uncovered is that people can generally tell you if it's, it's fairly closely. In dealing with marketing research, we have a hard time getting people to even remember products that they bought if the product is not something that they buy frequently, when the last time they purchased the product was. And then trying to get them to go beyond that and tell you why they purchased a product is even more difficult in doing market research. And there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, people are, in, in our society, overwhelmingly, pathetically middle class. What do I mean by that, by being pathetically middle class? It's something I strive to not be every day. It's pathetically middle class. So I'm just, I'll just tell you, I'm just obnoxious. I say obnoxious things. When I was associate general counsel here, I tried to fire. I was like, I, unlike Donald Trump, who doesn't actually like to fire people, because he can't seem to do it in person. He has to do it by tweet. I really like firing people. I was pretty good at it, because I like confrontation. <laughs> Most people don't. Most people are really polite. And they don't want to tell you that your product is crap or that they had a bad experience. Most people are middle class. We are taught to be polite. Think about this. If you have a bad experience at a restaurant, how many of you will throw a wall-eyed fit? I can believe that. Um, most people won't. Most people will not, I, I was at dinner one night with a friend of mine, and she's normally sort of one of these pathetically middle class, 
professional women. She has an EDD and she worked for the State Department um, Vocational Education, which they now call Career Tech. I don't know why they call it Career Tech, it's Vocational Technical Training, right? So, we're, she'd had a few drinks and we were at this restaurant, Lou Divine, which has sort of locally sourced food and they had, they brought out the salad and it had all kinds of rosé in it, which is this sort of, you know, green that's not lettuce. And she starts picking it out, she's like, this is weeds! Weeds! I didn't pay $14 for weeds, get these weeds out of my, you know, and she, but she'd had a few drinks. <laughs> Normally, she would have just done what? She would have eaten around the frise, or weeds as she called them, paid the tab, and never gone back. That's what most people will do. Most people will, if they have a bad experience at a restaurant, they will pay the tab and they'll, they'll never go back. They're, they're, they're not gonna stand up and start throwing the frise out of the salad <laughs> and claiming that it's weeds. And these are like hidden objections. Most people are not gonna articulate a lot of, you know, because maybe they're, they're polite. Again, even with products that they like, getting them to articulate what it is that they like about them. Think about the things that you buy. Is there one reason that you buy the clothing that you buy? It's probably a huge range of things. Like what? Price. As I look around the classroom, Nobody is a Lady Gaga in here, or from my generation, a Madonna. You know, you're all dressed in what would be considered within the range of the navigational beacons. You're dressed like normal college kids dress. Nobody is wearing, you know, some out there, although Lady Gaga has become far more conventional in her in her dress more recently. But but most people dress within, you know, so part of what you're wearing is a result of what you can afford. It's also a result of what is expected of college kids. What do, what do you sort of wear? When my mother was going to college years and years ago, there were rules. Women could not wear slacks. You had to wear a dress. Men had to wear you know, at most colleges, it was sort of expected that you wore a button-down shirt and slacks. That has changed over time, but we, we tend to stay within what is sort of normal. And we don't necessarily think a whole lot about that in, in depth. And so this is a lot of the purchasing, or a lot of the reasons we don't purchase, may be even very difficult for us to articulate why we don't do something. And so trying to uncover those can be really, really difficult. The stopper, some sales just can't be closed. I think you should go back and you should ask over and over and over again, and I've talked in here extensively about my friend who works for US Foods in this restaurant that he visited, he went back every week, and he was a rejection junkie. He went back until they, they you know, needed him. And I think that's admirable. But you also have to balance that with I mean, he could do that because he was calling on other restaurants that were close. I mean, at some point in time, after eight or nine or ten times, um, you may just not be able to close the deal, and it may not be the deal uh, for you. And that may be um, a reality that you have to face. So some sales just can't be closed. Most can, but some just can't. And at some point, you have to be able to recognize that you're probably not going to close that, that deal. So how do forestall objections. Know your product. If you know your product and you can effectively demonstrate it, by the time you get to the demonstration, after you've asked questions, you can forestall a lot of that if you really know what kinds of benefits your product is going to give. Now what kind of social style is going to be receptive to the anticipating and forestalling their objections. I would say expressive. You think expressive? Why? Expressive or direct? Because they they'll be more outspoken 
about it and say that they you know, they want to know now, kind of like instead of waiting. Okay, I'll buy that argument. I would have said a driver because the driver's going to want to know you now. If you can tell them, you can sell them up front. So I think your second is, is more accurate. Um, which one is going to be hardest to anticipate or solve their objections? The analytical because of their low responsiveness. Okay, yeah, I think that's, that's correct. Uh, it's going to be difficult because analyticals are going to think so broadly and they go off on so many tangents that it can be difficult to predict what kind of tangent is going on in their mind. I think I read to you a passage when we were talking about communication in here from Snowball and the, the part about Charlie Munger. Did I read that passage to you? Didn't we talk about Snowball? The one where he says he, he's just sitting there with his head turned off? Didn't I read that? Yeah, I think I read that. So in, in that discussion where uh, Gottfried's lawyer is negotiating with Charlie Munger, for those of you who remember this, Munger testifies, I was just sitting there with my head turned off. I was thinking about, well, nobody really turns their head off. They don't really just think about nothing. It's impossible to think about nothing, isn't it? Can you really think, now I guess Buddhists will tell you yes you can because nirvana is the realization that everything is nothing. I'm you, you're me, we're the wall, and this is all a grand illusion. And it's the understanding, but it's so, for, for those of us who are mere mortals and not you know Buddhist monks, it's so hard to not think about something, isn't it? Even as you're sitting here, and you're not listening to me, and your mind is going off in the moon, you're thinking about what? I'm hungry, I want to go get the burrito at the food court, I wonder what my insignificant other is doing, where are my friends, what am I going to do tonight, it's, what, Thursday, it's Easter, I mean, you're thinking about something, and so the analytical, I think you're correct, is the one that's likely to be off on a million different things, thinking about things and understanding, trying to figure out what it is that they're um, that they're thinking. It's going to be hard to anticipate and forestall that. Um, postpone the answer. Which one is most likely to be receptive to postponing the answer? So anticipate and forestall the objection. Know your product, be able, tell the driver what it is that you're going to sell them right up front so that they, you don't have the objection. Meet their objection head on. Anticipate that and forestall. Who's going to be most receptive to postponing the answer? The analytical. You think the analytical? Postponing the answer? Yeah. You think so? Amiable. Yeah. Who said amiable? Why do you think amiable? Because they're more friendly and more apt to be persuaded. They're also not going to be put off by the fact that you're postponing. They're, the, uh, amiables are what? Nice and friendly. They're nice and friendly. And so they're going to think about, you know, I mean, they're, they're not going to, they're not, again, amiables are pathetically middle class. They're not going to say, uh, you're non-responsive. Give me a response. They will, you know, and with them, if you can postpone it, you might be able to overcome it. And your text tells you that this happens frequently with price objections. Um, and other ways to keep this so that you don't interrupt the flow of your presentation, to say, that's a really good question. I think I'll get to that in the presentation. Who's going to be put off by that? Driver. A driver. A driver is going to be put off by that. They are going to be put off by the um, I'll cover it. They want their answer and they want it now while they're thinking about it. Answer, now this one, this one's the low-hanging fruit. Answer the objection immediately. A driver. Yeah. That's the one that you want to use with the driver. You, you don't want to put them off. You want to answer their objection immediately because they want what? They want what they want when they want it. And so they're going to want you to answer immediately. 
And the text tells you that most valid objections should be answered when raised. But drivers are going to be the most receptive to it. I'm not sure that there's one that would be the least receptive to answering immediately. But if you could make an argument, which one would you think would be the least receptive to just being straightforward and out there and answer yes? Amiable. Amiable. I think that may be correct. Because they're going to wonder why. Like just chat. Just they're chat. Just back and forth. If you go too quickly and you, and you, and you hit it head on, they may be intimidated by that. They may feel that you know, you're being pushy and you're being a driver. Um, your text tells you, now this one is one that you have to be very, very careful about. It says don't answer an excuse. First of all, it's hard to, to determine, particularly in business to business sales, what is an excuse. All right, I mean, that, that, that can be an enormously complex thing, trying to figure out if somebody is just making an excuse. Um, so it's hard to figure out, and your text tells you not to answer an excuse. You can then turn it into a real objection. Uh, what's the most common excuse that people give? Well, it's the price objection. And I think if you don't answer it, um, you can you can run into problems, but your text does tell you don't answer an excuse. If you don't, with a driver, if they're giving you an excuse, they're least likely to give you an excuse, but if they are and you don't answer it, um, you're going to turn them off. You can refuse to answer an excuse probably with an amiable and get away with it. Or with an analytical, you can answer it without answering it by providing them with more information. So the plan for identifying objections, listen carefully. When you're doing your questioning of your prospect, it is really important that you listen. I will tell you that this device, and this is really critical, this device and this device and televisions have trained us to have the attention span of a nap. We generally don't listen well because we have been trained to hear things in 30 second sound bites. And if we don't hear it in a 30 second sound bite, our mind instantly starts racing and we move on to something else. And so training yourself to listen to people is really, really critical. So really listen during your questioning of the prospect. Really pay attention to what they're saying and, and listen to them carefully. It is impossible to do that if your mouth is flapping. It is physically impossible to learn anything about anybody else if you are talking. At least that's what my mother always said, and sometimes I follow that advice. Although, I became a college professor because I really, really like talking. And so I, I recognize, and it's hard for me, and I will tell you, it's hard for me to listen at this point in, in my career. It's hard for me. One of the reasons I did not want to teach for years in the MBA graduate program here at UCO is because it was team taught, and so you had to listen to another. You'd have to sit there. You'd, you'd team teach the class, and so for half the class, you'd have to sit there and listen to the other professors. And I've, I've gone through enough lectures at this point in my life that I just was not interested in listening to somebody else. But if you're going to do this with prospects, you really do have to listen. And so listen to them carefully. Figure out what they are really saying. Confirm with regard to this is really important. Yes. Um, when you were talking about like the driver like objecting and things, and you said was it the analytical that would keep on asking these questions? Yes, the analytical was. Okay. The driver will ask questions, but they're generally very pointed, and they're more they lend themselves oftentimes to more closed-end questions, a yes or no, because that's drivers have a tendency to be binary. They have a tendency to see things as yes or no answers. And so they want yes or no. Analyticals are going to be more open-ended in, in their questioning in many instances. Because they're going to, they're going to want wide-ranging information, whereas the driver is going to laser-like focus in on that. Um, confirm your understanding. With regard to complex products, it's entirely possible that 
you really don't understand the question. And so confirm, restate their question in a way that you think you're both using the same terms so that you understand what the question is. And what do I mean by this? For example, if you're selling ADP and your client says, I have safety concerns, what does that mean? You're probably going to want to say, I understand. Can you elaborate on what those safety concerns are? So, what does safety mean? I mean, if I use this word, safety, what kinds of images come to your mind in an ordinary sense? A seatbelt. A seatbelt to keep you from crashing through the windshield when you uh, are engaged in a, in a head-on car collision or a rear-end collision. That's, that's a safety feature of a car. What else do you think of when you think of safety? Crosswalk. What? Like a crosswalk. A crosswalk. So physical safety. Crosswalks are inherently dangerous, aren't they? Yeah. Do you know how many people have been killed crossing 2nd Street? When they put that dormitory, I just knew that was a horrible idea. I was associate general counsel when UCO leased what was then the Ramada Inn and turned it into a dorm. And I said, somebody's going to get hit because people on 2nd Street don't pay any attention. And they close <coughs> that light constantly. And in the first year, we had three students that were hit at that intersection. So you've got this thing that shows that people are supposed to, what are people supposed to do the minute you step into the crosswalk? We have this illusion that those striped white lines on the pavement mean that they're supposed to come to a screeching halt. If you have the, because the pedestrian has the right of way. But does that really provide you with much safety? No, it's if somebody's it's distracted. Right on red. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, it really, I mean, people are distracted. Those white lines are not really much of a safety feature, are they? Because they're not a physical barrier that's going to stop somebody. What would be a better safety feature? Yeah, like having an elevated walkway over. Second Street. That would be a true safety feature because it would keep. So you think about safety, a lot of people think about their physical safety. You think about insurance safety, like the catch-alls. Okay. Yeah. So somebody with regard to the ADP, what most people are probably going to say is, I, I have a safety issue with this. And what you're probably going to think is, well, they want to know if it's encrypted and can people, you know, get a hold of that data when maybe what they mean is safety from, as you pointed out, an insurance perspective, which is if you get this wrong, the tax tables changed radically, for example, this year as a result of the Trump tax program. And a lot of companies were struggling, companies like ADP and Paycom and Patriot Software, to update their tax tables in time when they passed the Trump tax bill, because they passed it when? Anybody remember when they passed it? They passed it really, really late in 2017. Now, the federal government operates on a fiscal year from October 1 to what? September. To September 30. But the tax year, this is the interesting, so the federal government operates on a fiscal year from October 1 to um, September 30. What is the taxable year, though? What's the taxable year that you pay taxes on? April. Taxes are due by April 15th, but that's not the taxable year. It doesn't run from April 15th to April 14th, does it? What's your taxable year? January 1. It's January 1 to December, December 30. They passed the bill really late. Generally, what they try to do in the past, historically, is they've tried to pass tax bills in time for it to have lots of time for the updates so that in the olden days, CPAs, for example, could get the new regs that would implement it and then they could figure it out. Now, this is all written into the software codes in terms of the withholdings. They passed it really late, 
And so a lot of companies were really struggling to, to update their tax tables. And so maybe what you're thinking is, and there are, there are definite, if you are a big employer, or if you're in any employer that's required to withhold income taxes on your employees, and you don't get it right, you could be liable. And so a safety concern that somebody might have is thinking, what happens if, if I rely on your tax tables, and they're wrong, and I have a withholding issue, and then I'm hit for the lot. If I'm hit for the well, ADP has an answer to that, right? If we mess up, we insure you up to this amount per employee. And so that, if they're saying safety, and you're thinking about encryption, and they're thinking about liability for taxes, you may be uh, not understanding, right? Um, another one that I use as an example is when I was in the private sector, we we built learning management systems. And we said that they were uh, compatible with all platforms. What is a platform in an ordinary sense? If you tell most people who are not tech people, we're compatible with all platforms, what, is that, what are they going to think that means? Your generation probably knows what it means. They can use it in any computer. They can what? They can use it in any computer. That's exactly what it means in the tech world. What does the ordinary person think? You say we're compatible with all platforms. What is the ordinary? Who is not tech savvy? What is a platform in the ordinary sense? It's a what? Like a surface. Yeah, a platform is literally what something that you. I mean, it's the def, a, a table is a platform for what? <coughs> for your computer or your books or your. Yogurt that you're eating, that's what, in an ordinary sense, that's what people think of. And if you're talking to somebody who's not tech savvy, they might not understand that. And so they might have an objection, you know, what do you mean by platform? And if you go into very technical, specific terms, they may not understand it. So confirm your understanding of their objection or their point of view. Empathy, acknowledge the prospect's point of view. Using empathy is enormously important. Select the specific technique that you will think will go with the social style of the prospect and with the type of objection that you're getting. Answer and then attempt to close. You should always be closing. You should always have a closing frame of mind. So what are some techniques for doing this? Feel, felt, found. I can understand how you feel. This is the empathetic response. I can understand how you feel. Which response is that most likely to work with? Which social style? What? Amiable. Yeah, that's correct. It's going to work with the amiable because they like what? They like emotion and feeling. Who would be the second most likely to use the feel felt and be responsive to that? The who said expressing? I think that's the correct answer. Why would it be expressive? Because analytical and driver are more like fact-based. Okay. And expressives are less like felt, but like they still emote. And they also want to be the star, yeah. right? And by using feel, felt, found, you're making them the what? You're making them the star, the center of attention. So I think it works well. Is it going to work well with the driver? You can tell a driver, I, I understand your feelings. You want to talk about it? You want to lay on the couch for a little bit? Let me psychoanalyze you. What's a driver likely to do? Get out! You know, I don't want, no, absolutely not. Compensation or counterbalance. Providing statistical evidence. Who will that work well with? The analytical. The analytical. Yeah, it will work well with the analytical. Who else might it work well with? Okay. A driver would be the secondary. I think that would that it would work well with. Providing they're going to want facts, like I just get to the point. Um, I think it will work well. It might work less well with the driver, and the reason I think that is that it works well, but if you start to overwhelm them with evidence and they think that you are just, you know, 
just selling them or snowing them with numbers, they could be put off. Asking a question to sort of uh, amplify why they have the objection. Why do you feel that way? Who is that going to work well with? Amy Wolves. It will work well with Amy Wolves. Absolutely. It's not going to work well with drivers. Because a driver, it's probably going to be more pointed. Deny the objection. Who is that least likely to work with? Driver. Denying the objection is least likely to work with? Well, See, I switched the order of my questions. <laughs> so you have to listen. Who is it least likely to work with? Denying the objection. Um, Maybe analytical? Analytical because I think they know what they're talking about. Yeah, it may, I think the one that, it, it, you could see that it, it would not work well with an analytical because if you just deny it and you don't give any other information, the analytical is going to think that you're trying to snow them. But I think it really does not work well with amiables because amiables want, I mean, they, they want you to feel, I mean, denying the objection is the antithesis of feel felt bound. What you're saying when you just straight up deny the objection is what? I, I, you're wrong. Uh, you know, if you just straight up and say, and, and there is a model called the challenger sales model which, which uses this, um, the amiable is going to be put off maybe by that. The driver is going to love it because, you, you know, get to the point, tell me what I want to know, um, you know, and, and, and don't waste my time. The boomerang method allows you to, uh, to agree. Again, this is, this is similar to the feel felt found. You can agree, but show why the objection is not going to prevent the purchase. I can understand your hesitance to buy ADP based on the price, but if I can show you that this will actually save you money, are you willing to sign the contract today? ADP is more expensive than Patriot software, generally speaking. But if that provides you, or if you can actually compensate for that, would that, would that overcome your objection? Who is the curiosity method least likely to work with? I said least likely to work with. Driver. driver, that's correct. It's least likely to work with the driver. Why? Yeah, they don't care. They're, they're, they, they already think they know what they know, and they're not likely to be all that curious. Who is most likely to be curious? An analytical. Yeah, the analytical is most likely to be curious. Deflection. I know what you mean. I get it. But as I was saying, this is called the pivot method. Politicians do it constantly. Some do it better than others. I think I've mentioned this before. In watching the debates, the vice presidential debates between Sarah Palin and Joe Biden, all politicians pivot. They all are going to answer the question that they want to answer so that they get their message out in that 30-second soundbite. But most of them, and Joe Biden, Joe Biden was really good at this, he would say, Yes, that's an interesting thing. We really should focus on Russia. But, you know, in terms of national security, we need to make sure our economy is strong. Do you see how that's a pivot? So suppose the question is about national security and defense with, with you know, the Russians, and Joe Biden turns it into, what do, what do Democrats always want to talk about? Well, generally, they want to talk about the economy because they think that the economy does better, and statistics have shown that it does do usually slightly better under Democrats over the long haul. And that's one of the things that Joe Biden and Barack Obama wanted to point out, was that the economy was getting better under them. Then it, who, who wrecked the economy? George W. Bush. And they wanted to focus on the economy. So you can turn national security into an economic in interest, but that's not what most people think it is, right? So there, was, there would be like these pivots. Sarah Palin was the worst. She would just say, I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, she just was going to give you the answer that she had re rehearsed in the script, and she didn't really pivot. Who would pivoting or deflection work well with? Okay, who would it 
not work well with. It's not going to work well with the driver. Pivoting and deflecting is not going to work well with the driver. A driver is the, I want you to look me in the eyes. There's something, and by the way, we're one of the few societies that believes this. Most other societies don't believe that you should look people in the eyes and stare them down. But drivers believe that. I want you to look me in the eyes and give me a straight answer. Yes or no? Buy an It's not going to, you know, deflection is not going to work well with that. Who would it work well with? Amiables. Yeah, it works well with amiables because they're amiable. They're nice. And they're not going to challenge you necessarily on, on that. Do you think the majority of the population is amiable? No. No, I don't know. I think um, it, it depends. It's, it's more, I mean, your text tells you that probably that for every four people you meet, there is one social style among all of those four. I generally don't think that. I think by and large, on the whole, Americans tend to be more amiable and expressive than other nations. There are other nations that are, tend to be much more you know, drivers. Um, I will tell you in my experience, and of course this is anecdotal, and uh, I've never done a social styles test on Germans, but I was a, a foreign exchange student in Germany. Um, Germany is full of sort of Teutonic people who are drivers. They're, they're just sort of, you know, I mean, the, their personality matches the country, which is sort of cold and sterile. And I, I, that was my experience, was that they, they tended to be much more uh, a, a driver society. Um, whereas I think America, we believe in individuality, and we reward creativity, and so we tend to have more. And it's probably a cultural deal and a nurture deal, not necessarily a nature deal um, with regard to Americans. I think we tend to be more expressive than, than other, and more amiable than other countries. Um, but your text will tell you that, that one in four people will have a different social style than you. I think most people in America tend to be expressive or okay, because those are the sort of the things that we value as a society. And as a result, I think we've enculturated people to that. Did you have a question? Yeah, the curiosity method. Did we say that one was the analytical or analytical? Which one? The cu curiosity method. Which the curiosity, the I think, is going to go more with the analytical. You might be able to use the curiosity <coughs> with the expressive yeah. because you're asking them about them. But it will definitely work with the analytical. The deflection will not work with the driver generally. It's the least effective with the driver. It works well with amiables. Who else might it work well with the deflection? It's not going to work well with drivers. What? Yeah, it's going to work well with amiables. <laughs> Which other one? Expressives. It might work well with expressives if you can turn it back to being about them. You might also be able to use that one with analyticals because they are they are prone to going off on tangents and thinking about other things in their analysis paralysis. Any questions about objections? I don't know that we'll get them all the way through, but we can finish on Tuesday. I'm quickly closing. So closing. A close is a question or an action intended to elicit a marketing response from your prospect to get them to buy whatever it is that, you, that you're trying to sell. Your text tells you that most salespeople fail to ask for the close. And I've seen this even among seasoned salespeople. I was in the dentist's office the other day and I think I told you this story. And the Henry Schein representative and one of our, one of our best sales students went to Henry Schein and he's done really, really well there, Jonathan Carter. Um, the Hendershine rep came in. These are the dental tools people. 
and said, well, here's what I've got, and I just want to leave you some information, and that's it for today, and then walked out the door. And I was listening to the hygienist was cleaning my teeth as she was talking to the, as the Henry Simon representative was talking to the dentist, and what did they not do? Oh, just saying if you need anything, here's the new stuff. Um, here's the new product line. Didn't ask for clothes. Lots of salespeople, they, they do well with the approach, they do well with the presentation, and they fail to close. So you should always be closing. Again, we think of the close as being the end of the sales process, but as we'll see when we talk about services, it's not necessarily the end of the process because most relationships, particularly in the business-to-business -business world, are going to be long-term. And so you should always be closing. And again, be receptive to the close. Now, 20% of the sales that you'll make, if you do this long enough, will be pretty easy. And you'll be able to close them when? Fairly upfront, which means that you're going to skip and uh, you know maybe the presentation or a lot of the presentation and just be able to close. If somebody walks in and says, I need a new copier right now that collates and staples, and you, you start, you know, well, let me, let me present, you know, give them the copier. That's not going to be the vast majority, but you can close, you know, up front. So always be aware of when the prospect is ready to close. You can't just think of this as being a linear process. In many instances, the sales process, we think of it as being linear, you know, where you start out with prospecting, pre-approach, planning, you know, approach, presentation, and then close. But in many respects, because these relationships are long-term, it's cyclical. And you have to think about this in terms of a cycle and not necessarily in terms of a linear type of approach. So always be aware of when somebody's ready to close. Decisions are difficult for people, particularly if it's a small business or a business consumer, where what you're dealing with is the person's own livelihood, perhaps. That can be a difficult thing to do. If you're dealing with, and a lot of you will go into selling in small business relationships, and those can be enormously difficult because entrepreneurs are oftentimes thinking about their own, of course, economic well-being, and they're focused on short-term goals. The vast majority of companies in this country focus on, and they set their planning um, uh, for their buying decision based on a return on investment, which is a very short-term way of thinking about it. Um, this is not the way, by the way, that companies in other countries approach things. And so one of the things that I remember watching in my graduate program and studying was the differences between Japanese culture and American culture. And if you go to a bank in Japan and you tell them that we're going to have, for example, you know, I, I need money to invest in capital, and as a result, we're going to have 15 quarters of losses and you're asking a bank to give you the money in Japan, they don't necessarily think that that's an odd thing. If you go to an American banker and you say, we need you to invest or give us a loan to invest in capital and we're gonna experience 15 quarters of losses, an American banker is gonna look at you like you've just, you know, being down from another planet. And so they think in much more long-term perspectives, but uh, most businesses in America are, the, the vast majority of businesses are uh, sole proprietorships and DBAs in this country, and so you're going to have to deal with them, and they are going to focus on ROI, and so understanding that these, di these decisions are difficult, and what do I mean by ROI? What is their buying decision based on if you're focused on ROI? The, the, your business students, you should know what ROI is. Well, return, return, return on investment. They want success. They right. Want. They want to know how this is going to either make me money or save me money. And so it's going to be a return on, on investment. So consider their feelings and then reassure and guide the prospect to the decision. 
Now your text tells you this, reassure and guide the prospect. If you're dealing with the driver, are you going to do more guiding or reassuring? You're going to do more guiding, and it did better be what? More direct. And you know, are you sure you feel okay about this? Really? You want, you want to take some time to think about it? Don't do that. Right. So the closing consciousness. Attitude is a critical factor. It's very easy in the We've gone over this a lot in this class. The most difficult thing for most salespeople is rejection and hearing no. And it's very easy to become sort of despondent if you've gone into, you know, or talked to 15 prospects today and they've all told you no. So what are some things that you can do that we've talked about in here? Um, this is worth five points that you can do to keep an attitude that is a closing attitude and a winning attitude. Well, like you had a second. Hold on. Uh, a follow up with the person like, later on down the line. Okay. Not taking an actual rejection. Okay. Well, like for me, like I work at a chiropractic <clears throat> office and we went to like this show to like recruit like new patients and stuff. But it's like a numbers game, like you ask 20 people, five of them will be like, yeah, and like actually sign up. So it's like you can't like get down about it because not everyone's like hurt or needs help. Like you just have to like keep going like the mindset like it's going to happen, it's going to work. Like it's the way that you think about it for me. Like because I was getting down and my boss was like, no, like this is just like it's a game. Like you just have to play and like you have to ask everyone if they want to be like participate and stuff like that. Okay, so that is one that is a, that is one of the things that we're talking about is you have to look at it as... It's not personal, and it is a game. Yeah. It's a number. It's a numbers game. Thinking about this in terms of this is not personal. It is. It's a numbers game. Yeah. What did Amy J. Cuddy say that you could do to to increase your odds of of understanding that? And feel that? Yeah. You, you can power pose, or you can do things that that make yourself assured that you are going to do this. Your mind affects your body, and your body affects your mind. And so, if you if you do this, if you do the power posing, if you if you straighten up, if you do things just consciously as you're driving to the the, the difficult person that you've gone to three times and they've told you no, if you will, I, I watch the way a lot of you, and I have bad posture as well. I admit this. But one of the things that I do in my car, coming here every day so that I can be up and be prepared, is I set my seat deliberately at a sharper angle than what I normally sit at when I'm watching TV at home. Because that forces your body into that, into that posture. And if you stand up straight, you, your body will respond and it will tell your mind that you are more confident. Now what do I see you all do when you roll into the parking lot? A lot of you like slouch down in your car and you're driving, you know, I mean, physically change some of these things and it will affect your attitude. Have the courage and your convictions. Be persistent and don't take rejection personally. And that's hard to do. And it's easy to say, it's easy for me to say, don't take it personally. But what I can tell you is that if you practice these techniques, if you practice standing up straight, and you practice making presentations and having people criticize you, I have suggested to you that one of the things that you can do it's, that will help you get more comfortable in front of a crowd and in front of making presentations is go do karaoke. Oh, yeah. Go do I mean, you, like, you're probably going to be horrible. I'm horrible at it. I've got karaoke videos on YouTube if you want to watch it. I love karaoke. I don't understand why people don't like it. But go do karaoke. It will get you comfortable. And the nice thing about karaoke is you don't have to think about the presentation to start out with. The words are on the screen for you. So it's an, it's an opportunity to build confidence and you know run the risk of being booed off the stage, which my friends have done to me, trust me. Um, but it's one of those things that you can do that, will, that your, your body and your actions can change your mind, your mind can change your body, and that can change outcomes. 
that's a good place to stop. Um, so we'll finish this and talk about the services on Tuesday. Yes, please come up now. Please come up now and don't let me forget my. Yes, if you talk, you got some points. I was like, no, I'm not sure. I was going to then. Really? <laughs> That's that's always a plus. It's always my response. I've got one student who says horrible, and it's just to see if you'll say really, because most people are like that's great. <laughs> People do it to get kind of reaction here. What's up?
pods currently because I need to get I, uh, I graduate in exactly <laughs> Did I get those yeah, checks right this well, time? I'm not sure about ALOs. Yeah. Okay. Because I thought it, when I sent you an email, I thought it was only, did we not pay her for the third pay? Hold on, I'll show you what she sent me. Uh, what she sent you, okay. Yeah. Let me just set this down. Oh, I can. It's mostly, all I had to talk about is that. No, this is uh, principles. Sorry? This is principles. Oh, principles of marketing. Set this up. Oh, I understand you're taking the Florida Atlanta job. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, at I'm least excited. For, I'm excited for at, you at personally. Least, uh, unless the Florida Gulf Coast people offer me, and I talked to them for a long time at Gardner. And I sent them, a, I mean, they asked me a lot of questions about starting a program. Yeah. And I sent them very detailed because I went and through our budget and figured out how much it was to build out our lab and stuff like that. Sure. So I sent them a lot of information. Um, so, and they just posted the job like Friday. Oh. So I applied for that. Okay. So, but the, hoping. But the Atlantic job, they don't have a sales program, do they? No. They want to build one. And Florida Gulf Coast doesn't have one. Okay. But they want to know. Yeah, Florida International doesn't either. Florida International does not. Um, Central Florida has one. Oh, they got a great one. Yeah. Florida State, I guess, are the yeah. only ones that have yeah, yeah. yeah. Central Florida's got the, you know, got the blessing of having 55,000 on campus students. I mean, you know, uh, you know, that's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. they've got. That's like, you know, yeah. That's like, Aren't look, they the largest? Yes, the uh, largest on campus, on campus, campus school in the country. Yeah. Nobody really knows that. And in their um, eyes, they're the national football champions yeah. from last year, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. So. And it's kind of amazing that they've just become that, because they weren't. No. Um, actually, Miami-Dade was the largest oh, on campus they? for okay. a long time. Um, so I think it's kind of... Well, Miami-Dade used to be junior college, is it? It is. Oh, well, oh. they've got a four-year program now. Yeah, they do. Oh, okay. um, well, they've got some. Yeah. It's limited. 
Um, but yeah, so. so a lot of people going to Florida to go to college. <laughs> so this is what she sent me. I went back and looked at the note that I sent you an email off of, and it was different than it didn't justify or didn't, you know, didn't jive with check. So I'm just wondering. Okay. This is what she said. She said he, being you, recorded sales of four hundred dollars, eight sales for quota number two. Uh -huh. I actually sold five hundred, right. just ten okay. sales. Okay. The day I had received eighty dollars. Commission. I also had given him cash for sales. He later verified the sales report and corrected my. Great. Therefore, I was 20 short um, right. for right. two. Okay. Um, Kaiser reported that and had 600, but really I had 750 12 sales for quota three. Okay. And she said she received 10% of 600, which was 60. Therefore, I was $90 short from period three. Is that oh, correct? I see. Where I don't know about period three. Did you go back and look at the, did you write her a check, or did you check this check from period three, by chance? I didn't, I just okay. sort of took her word out of it, oh. I was trying to get, so, okay. but. Well, if, that, um, if that's accurate, then, then what you wrote it would be accurate. Okay. But I I was unaware yeah. of, 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 at least I can't that, think of that, I have to go back. Was really had 750. Well, I gave her 12. Okay, but she said she. I gave her 12 sales, but I don't know about the 750. Okay. But you said the check that you gave her was uh, for ten percent of six hundred and not seven fifty. I'll have to, I'll have to okay. check and verify that. Okay. okay, good. All right, thanks. Sure. Thank you.